Hello and welcome to making digital identity more inclusive and accessible at the Fusion Digital Summer 2021 edition. Um, I'm here with three amazing guests on my panel who will introduce themselves shortly. Um, so why are we even talking about identity? Well, um, we have this thing about open metaverse, as you might have seen if you have been watching um, longer than uh, just this minute in this um, in this conference. And um, well, if you think that you know this open metaverse composed of different, maybe centralized, maybe decentralized components in the virtual world, in the real world, and somewhere in between, if you think that that at some point might eat the world, if you will, to to start to encompass almost everything, well, then we better have identity solved um, well and in a way that works for all of those. Uh, how many are we? Eight billion? Eight billion humans? Um, and maybe pets, maybe AR pets. We just came from AR pets in the last uh, in the last session, probably. Yeah, actually. Um, but without further ado, um, I am Aaron van Ammers. I'm CTO and founding partner of Outlier Ventures. Um, and um, uh, we have with us um, Evan McMullen, Alex Prukshat, and uh, Ankur Banerjee. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to um, yeah, let us let, let the audience know who are you, what are you doing, um, uh, which uh, organization do you feel most affiliated with, because you probably have more, uh, more hats than one, as most of us do. Um, and what I'm also going to ask you is um, if you could uh, tell the audience something about a project in digital identity that you are working with or have worked with that um, yeah, really can show like how accessibility and inclusiveness matters and how it comes to be, um, just so that we can make this a bit more uh, tactile and understandable. Um, I'm going to go from the top of my screen. So um, Alex. Yeah, happy to meet you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Alex Pochard. Um, German Spanish background and um, in the SSI space, at least um, beyond the uh, blockchain space, I co authored with Ramit Reed a book that was recently published, which is called Self Sovereign Identity um, with Manning, um, with the publisher in the United States. And I'm also a co founder with him of SSI Meetup, where we just publish a lot of content about around SSI. So, in that relationship, and I mean, one use case that I think is very um, related to current times is something that Ramit has been actively working on in the, in the last time and um, together with Evanim, which is just like a global credential for airlines um, in terms of having a health pass, but you know that you're vaccinated and stuff like that. So they're rolling this out for many different airlines around the world. And yeah, I think this is a good use case because I think um, for, for the SSI space, like the whole COVID situation has been like a, something positive in a sense that it has pushed for more digitalization or more decentralization sometimes because you have all these different silos that um, nothing could be done really quick so you needed something that would work cross silo wise so that's just one example that i can come up with that just happened very recently great thanks very much and by the way i say we're here with three panelists and you can see that we were supposed to have marta piakarska with us uh, unfortunately she couldn't make it today um, um and yeah evan um who are you? What are you doing? Uh, thank you so much, Aaron, and, and thank you um, to Fusion Digital for having me here today. Always very excited to talk about the world of self-sovereign identity, um, especially alongside such uh, esteemed colleagues. Um, I, I heard a little bit um, from the last conversation about um, the, the possibilities of, of AI and the metaverse in which we live that can include companions, and uh, as well as the fun tokens that we know and love that sit in our wallets at home today. Um, so uh, I work most closely with the CERTO team at Consensus. Uh, we are focused on making data more accessible, private, valuable, um, and, uh, and scalable. And so what that usually means on our day to day is that we are operationalizing new technical standards for verifiable data and for decentralized identity. Um, and so one of the uh, one of the ways that this exhibits itself is um, we help organizations from rock bands to research universities um, figure out how to make at 
attestation say things about uh, about their work, about the achievements of others, about um, assets in their lives uh, in a way that can be verified by any other party. Um, so one of the exciting challenges that we have in the decentralized metaverse, um, as Jamie Burke notes here in the comments, um, is that you cannot have a decentralized web without decentralized identity. And right now, we're starting to see a lot of examples where there are decentralized assets in an application, um, but the identity layer is centralized. So in the Ethereum ecosystem, for example, um, we have uh, music sharing platforms and um, open source contribution um, organizations, things like Gitcoin and Audius, um, fun applications built on decentralized assets. But with a centralized identity layer, we sort of hamstring the possibility of this metaverse. Um, and so one of the things that we are working on at Certo is how to give um, contextual uh, achievements and reputation to members of DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations, um, allowing people to participate in these digital self-organized communities based not only on what's in their wallet, so the wealth that they have, um, but also on the achievements and expertise they have in the form of credentials. Great, thanks. Ankur. I'll go next. Hi, I'm Ankur Banerjee. I am CTO and co-founder at Checked. Uh, we are a much younger startup. We started this year and part of Outlier Ventures base camp as well. So excited to be here at Diffusion and talking about digital identity. Um, what we're trying to do at Checked, and this is part of like, you know, the broader vision of how you make digital identity more accessible for users, is we are working on mechanisms where the different actors within a checked and trusted data ecosystem can get compensated for the work they're doing in terms of adding reputation and authority. Um, and in terms of like, you know, how this works, I really believe in interoperability is a big part of making SSI realistically possible. I don't think people are going to download say 50 different SSI wallet apps. So although we are currently building and have a testnet live, working on the Cosmos blockchain, we do plan on supporting multiple standards. One example of a project which I've been uh, sort of involved with in the past, um, it comes down to the National Health Service in England. Um, this was a project that involved multiple SSI vendors, but the project was about how can we make it easier for doctors within the National Health Service who in, in England who work across different hospitals how do you make it easy for them to transfer their credentials across and get onboarded or signed on as an employee at a hospital really easily? And when you think about it, there are about 16 different pieces of paper, like traditionally, that they have to carry in on day one. And, and a lot of doctors fail their ID check on day one purely because they're not carrying the right piece of paper. So what we start seeing in a lot of these different mechanisms is uh, there's the traditional ways of how identity gets verified um, is quite often built around paper documents or paper processes. And there's a lot of value in giving people control back of their data in a digital format. I often describe it as having a digital copy of your driver's license and how, how you can make that more accessible is, is a very interesting topic and I'm very interested in diving into that. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. So then, um, let let's start from the from the um, the human side, if you will, because ultimately this is this is for humans. Um, like, what are some uh, factors or or, or uh, examples that uh, would make digital identity less inclusive and less accessible that you've seen, and how? How are they being solved? Um, any takers? Otherwise, I'm just uh, at this point. Yeah, anchor. So, an example of how digital identity is being used is if you take the example of uh, COVID test certificates and vaccination certificates for international travel. Um, it's very hard to create, or it's very it's not desirable to create an international database of everyone's test results and vaccination records. Um, and what we find is there are very different health systems across these different countries. So how do you take it along? And I'm actually in a scenario right now where I have seen it with friends and, and my partner. Uh, when they travel internationally, what they have to do is they just carry PDFs or show PDFs on a phone. 
which are easy to fake. It's the only sort of like, you know, default fallback format that works for everyone. Um, so there are movements right now within the European Union, for instance, for having something called the EU green certificate that you can take along. There's the National Health Service in the UK doing something similar and the International Air Transport Association doing something similar as well, um, which is give you a copy of the digital credential that you can carry on your phone and you can easily display that. And it's, it's, it's trusted, it's verified, it's checked. What happens if your phone dies? Um, how, do you, how do you have a copy that works in an offline scenario? We're, we're not even talking about, say, if you have a smartphone in the first place, which itself is a digital divide. Um, but if you think of it as just an old scenario, your phone could be dead after a long flight. Or you could have a scenario where the app that you're using is not compatible with the country that you've gone to. And so although it looks like a QR code and you're like, every app should be able to read every single QR code, it doesn't actually work when you when you go to that place. So I, I think actually I want to ask Evan about this because you've you've really been looking at some of the concepts behind how this could be done across different countries, as well as the fact that sometimes to do carry out a check when you present these QR codes to someone, um, oftentimes you need like an active internet connection. And even if you forget the places that don't have internet or don't have good mobile internet. Um, living here in London, sometimes and I'm in a WeWork office and I don't have internet connectivity inside the building. So there are, even within like our urban scenarios, what you find is there are occasions when you cannot rely on the fact that there will be internet connectivity. So I'd love to hear, Evan, maybe, uh, because I know you've been looking at some of these aspects on how it's being tackled. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, for pitching that over to me. So I think um, actually this might be a, a great point for us to revisit. What do we mean by accessibility, right? What does it mean for SSI to not be accessible, as as Aaron asked? And so I think there are a few ways in which potential humans who might interact with the concept um, might be forestalled, frustrated, experience some friction in, in trying to engage. So at sort of the the lowest level, when we think about the underlying technologies themselves, um, developers of applications that are used and enjoyed, benefited, you know, by humans or, or human related systems, um, they need tools that are relevant and useful to them that are documented well enough that they can, you know, build applications using them. Um, and they need to be uh, accessible enough that they can interact with the kinds of, let's say, front end frameworks that these folks are familiar with, um, and be able to attach to the kind of database like experiences, even if not centralized that these folks are used to. Um, and so uh, we were actually chatting a little bit earlier, Alex made the really great observation that there's been a bit of um, kind of gatekeeping around these tools, meaning that they haven't been um, operationalized for use at scale in a friendly way that is very low lift for those engineers. It requires a pretty significant amount of um, restructuring of how you consider data to even use SSI tools at their most fundamental. Um, but then more at an app layer experience for a human being, if they're signing up for a self-sovereign identity, what does that mean? Um, so accessibility can be, you know, are they able to understand what's happening on the screen? It can be, are they equipped to manage a, path, a, a key phrase? Key, key passphrase or other um, means of, of handling a set of private keys? Um, is it localized to a language that they can understand? Is it going to, to work alongside the technologies from a hardware perspective that they have access to, whether mobile and on the go or desktop at home or even a tablet? Um, and so a lot of these permutations of how a person might interact with these technologies through an app layer, through a device, through uh, you know a, a united experience, um, most of them have not really been ironed out in a neat, smooth, clear way. Um, because as, as we note here, it's really hard to talk about identity without pairing it with a use case. Um, I, you, you need your identity in order to achieve some other secondary goal. So that secondary goal has to be really desirable in order for you to clamber over all of the effort required to get signed up with that self-sovereign identity. So obviously limiting the extent to which you can go places and do things via, um, or so, as we're encountering with this COVID passport is a sufficient incentive for most people, um, many people globally to go through the, the effort of downloading an app and obtaining you know, a virtual credential or even scanning it so they can have it as a PDF so they can travel. Um, 
So what does accessibility mean in the context of having internet or spotty internet, not having internet at all? Um, it really calls into question, um, you know, what are the requirements to be able to validate someone's, let's say, COVID-19 credential? Do we need that? Do we need to store it in a way where you can access it offline no matter what, even if your cell service is terrible? Or does it really need to live in a centralized, you know, in a centralized location that is kind of like a honeypot, may or may not be attacked, but can be managed Managed by a single authority, um, and so I think what we're what we've sort of landed on in this conversation is that uh, the centralized storage by, let's say, a sovereign entity of a, a database, including all of these names and whether or not they're vaccinated, probably not a great idea. Um, as we've seen with many centralized databases of you know uh, personally identifiable information, especially related to health, can be kind of a sketchy way to hold that stuff and can be very limiting in in the performance. Um, as you know, if you don't have self service, you may be out of luck. Um, and so that's why I'm really enthusiastic about um, credentials that are a little bit more client side that can kind of live happily on a device um, and be validated whether or not that device is connected to the internet simply by putting forth um, a set of information via QR code or that can be transmitted even locally via things like Bluetooth. Um, and so that's the beauty of, um, there's a, a W3C standard um, called verifiable credentials um, that, that basically provides, sets forth the data taxonomy for how you might write a credential by one party about some other subject and then be able to sign it cryptographically so that if anyone else encounters that credential in the future, um, they will be able to tell whether it's been tampered with, they'll be able to interpret it, throw it into a JWT resolver, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, so having some, um, some ability to validate that offline uh, can be super critical, especially when we think about people who are located in areas, whether it's your WeWork or they're on a boat in the middle of the ocean, or they're like, you know, at the border between one country and another in the middle of the mountains. There are a lot of these edge cases that we need to consider if we want to be able to provide, um, you know, useful experiences that can rival the ease and simplicity of a scanned PDF. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see how um, COVID-19 has accelerated so many things um, uh, in in many, many negative and sad things, of course, for everybody involved in uh, directly. Um, but uh, what I mean, mainly uh, mean to say is a focus on data privacy, a consciousness of data privacy of all of these subjects. It's really, you know, uh, been accelerated first off with uh, contact tracing remember when we did contact tracing that was last year now it's kind of a thing of the past but you know uh, hey suddenly uh the government wants to uh, to track who had contact with who and you know uh people who previously weren't that um uh, conscious of well you know i'm okay with the with our government and with what wait what you're going to track everything um and by the way we're already tracking it or through indirectly it, it has accelerated these sentiments i think in, in general population and you now see that indeed replay like you mentioned Anchor, in, in um the vaccination credentials or or yeah otherwise your yeah, COVID credentials and and the ways in which you know people could use them um and um yeah it, it's it's interesting to see like um the, the apps like here in the Netherlands, we had our little experiment uh, a month ago when uh, the, the the PM and, and everyone said, "Okay, now we're going to open up the clubs and the festivals." And the, after we did some tests, all in one go. And then, indeed, you know, some people came in with uh, with papers, with copies, with um, the apps didn't work. And then you see, you know, the the the, the, the nitty gritty of you know the what happens in the real world outside of the design. Um, so yeah, we, we need lots more of that to see how we can make this stuff actually work. Um, but I want to, uh, uh, then, um, go from this rant, um, to you, uh, to you, Alex, good luck with that. No, but, um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, as we spoke before, like, um, yes, we can talk about digital identity, it can solve many things. We can make it inclusive. Anybody can, can, you know, may everybody use it. Um, but there are also safety concerns because what if we are identifying everyone, um, even in self-sovereign ways? Um, so, what are your thoughts, especially in with with the example of uh, COVID contact tracing, vaccine passports, and maybe to that example, what 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 the, the tracking that's being done? 
um, what are what are some concerns and maybe some solutions um, in that end? Do you see? Yeah, yeah, happy to share that. I mean, I personally see like a number of challenges for the SSI space. Um, I mean, and I feel very close to many of them, which doesn't mean that I'm against them. It's just like that's what I perceived. So I think clearly one of the risks is, is, is what you just mentioned is that. I mean, in that sense, COVID has been a risk in reality because, and this has been perceivable, I think, especially in, in the European population, maybe. I don't know if it has been the same in the rest of the world. But um, um, but basically, um, everyone felt like, oh, I have to do what the government is telling me to do right now. And everyone downloads the same app and, oh, we all have to stay at home. We don't have to move and blah, 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 and so on. Which, to a certain extent, yes, it's like always this consensus that we have to reach as a, as a society about what we have to do for the collective good. But then the, the problem of this is also, okay, how will this be used in the long run? How, will, how, how, how are you conditioning people for the long run? And with SSI, um, this question comes up, like what, from what I've seen, a couple of challenges. One challenge is that I think many of the pioneers of the SSI community, they've been kind of, and I, I feel the same, but, um, but I think I've been trying to realize that there may be other aspects to this, like tree huggers in a sense, like, oh yeah, we all want our privacy and the world will be wonderful and we will all love each other and it will be great and everything will be so much better, you know, when we when we fight the bad tech companies that are stealing our privacy and, and, and making life difficult for everyone. And I agree, I mean, I'm part of that movement too, but, but, but um, maybe it's a little bit naive sometimes to, to have the perspective. And, 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 and together with that, I think it's also like that, um, Many of the, even if the SSI community is much more open than most tech communities that I've been part of. I mean, like if you take cryptocurrencies for example, I think SSI is much more open than 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 cryptocurrencies in a sense. Just by because you see other genders and people represented, I still think there's a long way to go, um, and, and about what can be done. And I think for SSI, it's much more important than for money and stuff like that because money is at the end not that important, but identity is everything. Because with identity, you really can control access for everyone and what it means. Who I mean, not who you are. I mean, what 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 you're allowed to do for your life. So and and the risk of all these solutions is like while we perceive this Western naive approach of life, like yeah, we will make everything better and blah blah blah, is that um, yeah? Well, what happens if we have these these supposedly decentralized systems and they end up not being so decentralized? And you have the random nice dictator coming around say oh how great i have all this data in the same database here and i can disconnect some people here and there when it's convenient for me and this is not like the case only for the usual candidates that people like to talk about i think this is this is a global trend and um, and, and it can happen anywhere and in in a world like as the one we were living today and again i think crypto has made this also more evident because the the talk around crypto for many years has been, oh yeah, we will make the world a better place. That we see that the distribution of the cryptocurrencies is very asymmetric, and a, a lot of it, a lot of it, a lot of it has been driven by 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 speculation, which is great because it has been nurturing the selfish, short-term orientedness of humans or of the majority of humans. So it allows to, these technologies to develop, but we didn't have that opportunity in, this, in the SSI space. So I think that's one of the challenges of the SSI space because the SSI space didn't have the same tools um, to monetize or fund th these technologies. And I think there's an incredible group of very intelligent people in the space, um, and, but they, they certainly didn't get that, those same opportunities. So we need to see how we do that and to finalize this thought. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in favor and exploring um, two ways. I mean, one, which is like, okay, the startups that need to do pragmatic things, like what are the solutions I can deliver today with the compromises I have to make today with the governments of turn that I have to deal with. But I think the other things that need to be funded too, and I was just talking with a VC um, person yesterday for a long time about all this, like, okay, how can we fund interesting research that, uh, about decentralized key management? How can we create a decentralized economy, a pseudonymous economy that is not based maybe on the models of a nation state? Because maybe some people, they don't want to live in a model of a nation state. They want to live in a pseudonym, pseudonymous economy where we don't have to follow those rules. I mean, yes, there are parts of this that might have to follow those rules. There are other parts that might not have to follow those rules. So a lot of, I, I believe, interesting questions that come up in relationship to, to where this might go. Thanks. Anku, keep it short and then I'll uh, get in the question. Very short. I think on that tree huggers point, I think self-sovereign identity as a term is itself a bit op opaque and scary. And like Evan said, 
people don't wake up in the morning and say, I want, a, I want an SSI identity. They say, I need to fly to France. They say, I need a bank account. They say, I need to have a social media website and they've locked me out. So, and they've asked me to prove who I am. Uh, so I think the terminology itself, while it works within the community, uh, when I start looking at how well, how would I, how would I explain this around the pub? Because the British people love pubs. Um, how would I explain this around the pub? Is that is a very key test of just making something more accessible. How do people understand it and use it? Yeah, indeed. How 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 do we make this work in the in the basement pub where there's no coverage? <laughs> because uh, so solving this accessibility problem by ensuring that everybody has a mobile phone, has perfect network coverage and battery always is probably not the direction we should uh, should go. Um, we uh, started a bit late. Um, I'm going to finish slightly less late, but uh, we were going to eat some uh, into the next session. So I want to finish, finish off with one uh, subject going from this and, and shifting a bit more back to the wonderful weird world of NFTs and, and metaverse. Um, you mentioned briefly at the start, uh, Evan, I think you said uh, a few years ago, people were using NFTs to access things. Well, right now, people are using lots of NFTs to, to access things. And uh, I mean, NFTs have been used uh, more than ever before, and they, they get ever more uh, interesting manifestations. Um, uh, in, in like in our uh, open metaphors, always uh, thesis, we, we uh, in fact relabel them as as sovereign virtual goods. It's all, because that's ultimately what it is. It, it's something that is virtual and that 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 can be um, tracked and exchanged and, and all of those things. Um, but um, what you see is like the in the the active NFT community, um, there's. Uh, everything tends to gather around one identity, right? You have your, your .eth address and there's, you know, all of your NFT collection, um, all of your, your funds in DeFi, and uh, you use those NFTs to get access to special Discord channels or to areas in, in, in the central land or in the sandbox or, or, or whatnot. Um, and I'd say that's, that's just, um, ultimately that, that's digital identity in a decentralized world. Um, but it's more the, well, hmm, we'll just use this and we'll go for it. And, and then it might not have, you know, it's, it's surely accessible, but it might not have some of the, the um, desirable or perceived to be desirable uh, characteristics of, uh, of SSI. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to ask you, uh, Evan, because uh, um, Anchor, we get another 20 minutes and uh, Alex, you had a really good uh, train of thought just now. Um, yeah, what, what are some thoughts that you have around that and how, you know, different ways that that might be changed there to to have or, or, or is nothing going to change, you know, or is it just going to expand and expand and we're going to end up with uh, a billion dot ETH addresses with lots of nice uh, uh, NFT arts on them? Artworks. That's a great question, Aaron. So I think when we talk about NFTs um, and identity, we invoke a few different parties there. There's the identity. How do we figure out who the buyer is of a given asset that already exists? Um, how does an artist or creator self-identify in the process of issuing and minting an NFT? And then for the NFT itself, how do we identify that asset and allow for it to accrue data on its journey? Um, so right now, you correctly note that ENS address or um, the, uh, the abbreviated human readable names that we redirect to other wallet addresses, most typically Ethereum addresses, um, solve a wonderful usability problem for human beings. Um, Ethereum addresses do not roll off the tongue. Couldn't, couldn't pick mine out of a lineup if you showed me right now, uh, but my ENS address, evan.eth, really easy to remember, remember, super easy for me to type in. And so when it comes to interacting with crypto assets and Web3 parties around the Web3 ecosystem, I always default to that address because it's easy for me to use. However, it is wildly inferior to uh, a different kind of identifier that might allow for me to do things like rotate my keys um, to have off-chain or private data that I don't share with others. Um, ENS addresses are a really challenging form of identity um, and, and wallet addresses in general. Actually, I'm going to broaden that. Um, not, it's not, not just an ENS address um, challenge because I do love ENS, but if we use wallet addresses as a form of identity, that means we can only extrapolate identity from on-chain transactions. Our on-chain on transactions are largely a reflection of what we own and what we have and not who we are and what we are capable of. Um, and so if we judge uh, or if we discern 
foreign users' um, identities from their on-chain transactions alone, we're going to end up with a plutocracy where privileges are granted based on wealth and accruals as opposed to capabilities and contributions. Um, and so the wonderful capabilities of ENS addresses um, that allow us to more easily maneuver around the world of transactions where we have to self-identify, type in a form field, um, what address we want things sent to when we want them sent to us. Um, but I'm very hopeful about a future where we can take our Ethereum addresses and wrap them in things like decentralized identifiers using our Ethereum address in the namespace of other forms of identifier technology so that we can have a set of keys, a public identifier, but the ability to exchange data that is private, off-chain, revocable, mutable, so that it can evolve. Our data portrait of ourselves, our reputation or identity in digital space can evolve in the same way that we as humans evolve so that we're not beholden to the same immutable transactions in perpetuity. Um, the last thing I will say also a challenge about using um, your wallet addresses or, or on-chain addresses, public identifiers, um, that exists now for your identity is um, if someone sends you, let's say, a non-transferable ERC-1155 token to your lovingly curated Ethereum address that you've you know, had a ton of great transactions on, they can essentially brick your wallet. Um, and so you put a lot of concentration risk when you rely or you, you invoke a lot of concentration risk when you rely on a public identifier for which you cannot rotate the keys easily. Great. Thanks. Oh, okay, you have a... And just to add something very quick over there, it's also very traceable. So uh, people can go see whom you've been interacting with. Yep. That itself is a privacy leak and risk. Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's uh, it's like a bank account. It's be your own bank, uh, except everybody can look in your, into your online banking. <laughs> it's like a public insane. Venmo feed. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's more, even more public than surveillance capitalism is able to publicize your personal metadata today. Yeah. Thanks. Well, on that note, um, I want to thank you all very much for uh, for a fascinating discussion. Um, I'm uh, anchor. I'm going to uh, pull you into the the next session uh, fireside about checks. Um, thanks to everybody in the audience uh, coming on today, and uh, yeah, especially to you guys. <laughs>